Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that our uh, sound system is going to work and cooperate tonight. My name is Michael DeSanto. I am a co-owner of Phoenix Books. My partner is Renee Reiner, and she and I own five bookstores in Vermont. So we have the Yankee Bookshop down in Woodstock, the Phoenix Books Misty Valley in Chester, Phoenix Books Rutland, Phoenix Books Burlington, and Phoenix Books Essex. I know that sounds like a... <laughs> I know that sounds like a grand empire, but there are five independent, separately operating bookstores, and I have a couple of partners who own those stores with me in some of the other towns, so we are really, really small. Um, I do want to acknowledge a fellow bookstore owner here, Mr. Ed Morrow from Northshire Books. My, my memory tells me that he founded that store, I think, in 1976, and it's been in operation ever since, and he has a second generation, Chris, his son, who has moved into uh, doing a lot of the hard work at that store, and I'm trying to do the same thing up here with my daughter, Catherine. We're here tonight to have a discussion, a forum, a community meeting on some of the issues facing small bricks and mortar businesses like ours as we cope with the internet. And to that end, we have brought in a couple of speakers and a professional moderator. My friend Fran Stoddard, who's our moderator, has been involved in communications and education for 25 years, and most of you have seen her on television, I'm sure. She really needs no introduction from me. Stacy Mitchell and Olivia Lavecchia come from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And they have compiled over the years some of the best information on what happens when big box stores come into play, as well as what happens when internet sales continue to grow and grow and grow. So in leading up to this event, uh, we ran some notices on our Facebook page, and we got the usual responses, and I just thought I'd take a moment. Uh, one response asked us if we were just going to bash Amazon. No, we're not going to do that. But a company that has $500 billion in market capitalization doesn't need to be protected from me. Uh, and then they asked if we were going to be fair and balanced. Well, no, because... In effect, because I'm renting the room and brought in the speakers, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I really need to be fair and balanced. We won't tell any lies, but it doesn't necessarily have to say, you know, there's lots of this and lots of that. So we're trying to get the word about, out about what small business and bricks and mortar businesses do for the community more than, than going after anything. And again, at my size, it's a little bit like a mouse roaring. Do you all remember that old Peter Sellers movie? Great film. Uh, so Stacy Mitchell is the co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and she has produced research and analysis for a number of years and, and is working with businesses like mine and Northshire. And Olivia Lavecchia is the research associate, and I have actually read a number of her reports, and she does a good job writing. So I give both of these ladies a lot of credit for doing some good work. I have back at our table some of that information if you care to pick it up and look at it tonight. Um, before I get off the stage though and introduce Fran, I want to mention uh, the supporters back in the back room. If you didn't get a chance, we have uh, Vermont Digger, Front Porch Forum, Cabot Cheese, and the Vermont Coffee Company, and Red Hen Bakery. Uh, all of which are very pleasant things to visit. Um, as you see on the program, though, the big supporters of this event are the Main Street Alliance. And in the interest of self, you know, of, of revealing what goes on, I'm a member of the Main Street Alliance, but they have worked very hard on this. Uh, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, by providing us our speakers, Vermont Digger, uh, who came to us or we came to them, depending on your point of view, and agreed to sponsor both of the events, the one here in Burlington and the one tomorrow night in Manchester, which is also sponsored by Northshire Books. 
Uh, and so the two bookstores that are doing this are Northshire and Phoenix, and we are pleased to be in their company. Uh, and the last group, uh, Paul, are you here? Paul Brune from, thank you, Paul, very much, from the Preservation Trust of Vermont, and they supported this event too. And I think that that was an interesting juxtaposition of support coming from a group like that, and we were really pleased to get it. I, I'm pleased with the turnout tonight. Um, thank you all for coming. And I'm going to stop now and turn this over to Fran Stoddard. But again, appreciate you being here, and I think this is going to be a very informative evening. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So you've already heard a little bit about Stacy and Olivia, but I'm going to do the more formal introduction. And then we'll hear uh, from Stacy um, for a couple of minutes just to ground us in the work that um, she and Olivia have been doing for a little bit. Then the three of us will have a, a conversation up here to go a little bit deeper. And then we welcome questions from the audience. And there will be people um, helping facilitate that. So that's how this evening's going to work. And we'll go, we'll go for about probably about an hour. So Stacy Mitchell is the co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Uh, it produces research and analysis to provide innovative strategies to support sustainable local economies. ILSR partners with a range of allies to design and implement policies that curb economic consolidation and strengthen community-rooted enterprises. Stacy is the author of Big Box Swindle and has produced which you can imagine what that's about. Um, and has also produced several influential reports, including Monopoly Power and the Decline of Small Business. She has served as an advisor to many community groups and policymakers. This is a very short little bio on what she has done uh, for now. Um, and so she is in the beautiful red sweater if you're not sure. And then I'd also like to introduce Olivia uh, Lavecchia. She is, um, as Michael said, the research associate with ILSR's Community Scaled Economic Initiative, where her work focuses on building awareness and a support for public policy tools that strengthen locally owned businesses and check concentrated economic power. She was the lead author of ILSR's report on affordable space, how rising commercial rents are threatening independent businesses and what cities are doing about it. Stacy and Olivia's co-authored in-depth study of Amazon that certainly caught major national attention recently has been cited by the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and the Atlantic, among others. Uh, they've also been er interviewed on NPR, on VPR Today, um, CNBC, and other broadcast outlets. Stacy and, uh, and Olivia are both based in Portland, Maine, which is convenient and lovely for us because it's not that far to get here. So um, we'll begin uh, the evening again with Stacy. Stacy, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks to Michael and Phoenix Books and all of the sponsors tonight. And to all of you, it's really wonderful to see you all in this incredibly lovely space. Um, I just wanted to basically set the table a little bit, just get us oriented a little bit around Amazon and some of the changes that are going on in our economy. And I won't take too long, and then we'll turn it over to a conversation and then ultimately to you to hear your questions. Amazon is in many ways very familiar to all of us. You know, it's the package on the front doorstep. It's the store that seems to sell everything. It's all one click away. If you have an Amazon Echo speaker in your house, it's, uh, it's so efficient that ordering from it is like a passing thought, you know? Um, it's something that's in a way very intimate to many of our lives. But as familiar as Amazon seems, in a lot of ways it's very invisible. It's as though we're able to see just this part of it that's above the surface, but what's really underneath is much bigger. And it reaches into all these different directions, directions that we don't even know about. And it has all of these implications for our economy. Amazon, I don't think it's an understatement to say, is in the process of reorganizing the commercial sector of our economy, and it has very big implications for all of us. 
but it all happens largely beyond our view. We tend to think of Amazon as a retailer, and that's a very easy mistake to make because Amazon sells a lot of stuff. They're now capturing nearly one out of every $2 that Americans spend online. They sell more books, toys, consumer electronics, and clothing than any other retailer online or off. But to think of Amazon as a retailer is to really misunderstand what this company is all about. And when I say that, I don't just mean that Amazon does a lot of things besides sell stuff, although that is certainly true. It produces hit television shows and movies. It publishes books. Uh, it manufactures a growing share of what it sells, everything from blouses to batteries to baby wipes. It delivers restaurant orders in many big cities. It underwrites loans. It sells advertising. It manages the data of US intelligence agencies. Amazon is one of the largest defense contractors in this country. And I could go on and on. Um, you may have read recently that Amazon is in the process of moving into the pharmacy sector, not only with the intent of distributing prescriptions, but also of managing prescription benefits on behalf of our health insurance companies. So I could go on. But the point I want to make when I say that it's a mistake to think of Amazon as a retailer is not that Amazon does all this other stuff too, but it's that the role that Amazon aims to play in our economy is a level deeper. It's a much more fundamental role in our economy that it's aiming for. It's bigger than all of these industries combined. Amazon intends to control the underlying infrastructure of 21st century commerce. And there are three pieces to that. The first piece is the online platform. More and more of our spending is digitally driven, and Amazon dominates the sort of online platform for buying and selling goods. And the key statistic in all of this to know is that 55% of all online shoppers now start their shopping at Amazon. It used to be that people went to a search engine, they put in what they wanted to find, different retailers would come up in that list and they would go where they went. Now, over half of people looking to buy online just start right at Amazon. How did Jeff Bezos do this? You know, I mean, it's pretty a remarkable thing. A lot of the answer to that question is Prime, you know, Amazon's annual membership uh, service. How many, how many folks are members of Prime? Yeah. Um, Part of the way Prime works, you know, it's a $99 annual fee. You get free two-day shipping and a bunch of other things, streaming television and all the rest of it. The, the, part, the reason that Amazon gets you to pay that fee is not because they want your $99. What they really want is they want to create a, a kind of psychological trick, if you will, which is that once we've paid that fee, we really want to maximize how much value we get out of it by getting as much free shipping as we can. And so what studies show is that once people become Prime members, they stop comparison shopping. They start their search on Amazon. Um, and they spend about twice as much as non-Prime households do on Amazon. So Amazon is increasingly the place where people are starting online. And because it's, got, it's controlling all of that consumer traffic, one of the things that's happened is that all these other businesses, independent retailers, chain retailers, small manufacturers, big manufacturers, they're out there too with their e-commerce sites. And it used to be that they could find someone, could, someone could find them through Google, but that's no longer what's happening. It's like they've hung their shingle out on a dirt road and there's like only occasionally someone walking by. So they face this really difficult choice, which is do I continue to go it alone or do I become a third party seller on Amazon's platform? And many are now becoming sellers on Amazon's platform. It's a treacherous road because of course you're dependent on your biggest competitor and there are all kinds of problems that happen there. So the online platform is one piece of this infrastructure for 21st century commerce. There are two other pieces. One is that Amazon uh, it has something called Amazon Web Services. And they control, through Amazon Web Services, 44% of the world's cloud computing capacity. Companies, governments, everybody keeps their, da keeps their data in the cloud now and analyzes it, manages it, moves it around in the cloud. Amazon is the major provider of this. 
Um, and the result is that lots of companies that compete with Amazon actually rely on it for cloud services. Netflix, Condé Nast, which you know, runs a lot of magazines, Comcast, Nordstrom, they're all on Amazon Web Services. And then the final piece of the underlying infrastructure of the, of the economy that Amazon uh, wants to control is that they're rapidly moving into shipping and package delivery. They've more than tripled the uh, square footage of the warehouses that they operate around the country in the last couple of years. Not only big warehouses, but they're building these sortation centers and these hubs closer to cities. They're doing more and more of the sorting of packages and organizing uh, that they hand off just at the last minute to the Postal Service or to UPS. And they're also just beginning to do that part of the job, too. So they're hiring third-party courier companies in big cities. They've got their own Amazon Flex program, which is like Uber. People can drive for it. You get a set number of packages, and you go out and make the deliveries for a kind of piece rate. And what analysts say is that Amazon is looking to take on UPS and take on the Postal Service, that they want to deliver not only their own packages, but they want to deliver packages for everybody else. And you can begin to imagine this future in which, as consumers, we expect the stuff that we order to show up you know, basically instantly. And maybe Amazon is the only company that can make that happen. And as it becomes more, um, the service becomes less and more expensive for other companies that use UPS, well, they're going to start using Amazon. So now they're riding Amazon's rails in yet another way. So all of this is, you know, is a very powerful and lucrative setup. Um, because what, if you think about it, Amazon basically has the pipes or the rails through which commerce has to move. And what that enables it to do is it can decide, here are the most lucrative pieces of this business. Here are the goods that we want to manufacture and sell. Here are the services we want to provide. And we'll take that. And we'll use the fact that we control the pipelines to push anybody else aside that wants to get that business. And then for everything else that we don't want to control, we'll let other companies do it. And we'll charge them a fee to ride our rails and will essentially tax the rest of commerce. This is a very uh, powerful setup that they have. It's really unprecedented in a lot of ways. And it's one reason that Scott Galloway, who's a professor at NYU and a consultant to a lot of corporations, um, has said recently that on the stock market, Amazon is going to be the first trillion dollar uh, company. Um, uh, and he says, and shortly thereafter, we should break it up. Um, it's another reason that uh, one of the most prominent Silicon Valley venture capitalists described Amazon last year as, quote, a multi-trillion dollar monopoly hiding in plain sight. And the word monopoly is really important here. Um, about 35 years ago, the federal government radically changed how they interpret our antitrust laws. And the result was that we don't really enforce a lot of our antitrust policies anymore. The consequence is that Amazon has been able to grow using tactics that even just a few generations ago would have been barred by federal authorities. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of what I mean. Um, so one example is that Amazon commonly sells entire categories of goods below cost. It's done this with books for much of its history. In fact, during Amazon's first six years in business, the company lost a staggering $3 billion selling books and other goods below cost. Competitors who can't afford to lose money like that went out of business, and it worked. You know, we, bookstores closed in droves, and Amazon now controls about half of all book sales nationally. Another example has to do with how Amazon deals with upstart competitors. How many of you ever um, have shopped or been to the website Zappos that does shoes? You know, you know the, sh the shoe retailer? So they got started sometime in the 2000s um, doing really well. They attracted uh, a lot of business. They had a different kind of way of thinking about commerce. And Amazon was watching them come up, and they said, we want to buy you. We don't want a competitor. And the folks who owned Zappos said, no, we're going to do our own thing. So Amazon proceeded to sell shoes at a loss. They lost about $150 million selling shoes at a loss. And this other company, Zappos, bleeding red, their board finally said, OK, we're selling. So Zappos is now owned by Amazon. They've done this multiple times. And this is one of the reasons we don't have a more competitive online environment. And I'll just mention, finally, a third example of the kinds of tactics that we've seen with this company. Um, 
As I mentioned earlier, many brands, many competing retailers have, have decided that they have to become sellers on Amazon's platform. They have to become third-party marketplace sellers. Amazon uses the information that it gleans from those sellers to compete against them. Some businesses do well, at least for a while, selling on Amazon, but there's no guarantee, and the stories of what can happen are quite stark. Um, there's been studies done by Harvard Business Review and ProPublica, a lot of reporting by Bloomberg and CNBC that have brought some of these stories to light. One example that I'll share with you is a, a small company called Rain Design. They're based out in the Bay Area. They're this small manufacturing company, and they make these kind of innovative laptop stands. They're like metal. They're kind of neat. Um, and they've done really well. They've been selling these for about a decade. They sell them on their own website. But because Amazon is such a dominant platform, most of their business is through Amazon's site. And they were the top ranked, you know, the first you go look for laptop stands, their product showed up first because they had thousands of four and five star reviews, right? One day they got up last year and all of those top rankings had been replaced by Amazon's own laptop stands, which looked exactly like theirs except they had the Amazon smile. Now a big significant part of their business is gone. I went and looked the other day, and actually Rain Design is now back at the top of the Amazon search rankings, but I noticed if you look up there, they're now a paid advertiser. So basically, Amazon has found a way to extract sort of coming or going one way or another um, more and more of the economy. Part of the reason that regulators haven't intervened in these situations is that Amazon's actions appear to benefit consumers, right, especially in the form of low prices. But I think we should be really skeptical of that notion, or at least skeptical that it's going to last um, you know, into the future. I mean, we know that competition is really critical, that having choices is what protects us as consumers in the marketplace. And we can easily you know, imagine a future where a lot of the things we need, we don't really have much choice for, or Amazon is so wrapped up in that they really call the shots and call the prices. It's also true that Amazon has a tremendous information advantage when it comes to setting prices over all of us. They collect a lot of data. They collect data on how long your mouse hovers over a certain thing, what you click on, what you don't click on, what you're doing on the web when you're not on their site. They collect data about what you stream from their streaming service. If you have an Amazon Echo speaker in your home, as many households now do, they're collecting all sorts of information from the very intimate environment of your home. And we know that they make price changes all the time. They use this data in ways that it's hard to know, but are they learning that we're not very price sensitive if we're shopping late at night? Or is that when prices are higher? So there's a lot going on there that I don't think is uh, quite as simple as is always benefiting consumers. And they also steer which products that we see, you know, um, whether it's rain design, whether it's Amazon putting its own books at the top of recommendation lists and so on. And so we can see, you know, maybe a less diverse marketplace because we've got sort of a gatekeeper now that's deciding which products make it to the top and which don't. It's also important to remember that we're not just consumers and that our economic well-being depends on our ability to make a decent living. One of the conclusions um, that we really drew, that Olivia and I drew in our research in this report that we published late last year, which is um, a long report, but also very readable and kind of organized into sections, so you can kind of pick and choose what you like. Um, but one of the conclusions that we found as we looked at this closely, we interviewed dozens of um, uh, small and mid-sized manufacturers and independent retailers. We reviewed a lot of the research out there, a lot of the reporting. And what we found is that Amazon's you know, increasing grip on the economy is really at the root of a lot of inequality. And there are a number of ways that this happens. One is that we've lost a lot of small businesses. You know, Amazon on national surveys is now the biggest challenge that independent small businesses are facing. And as those businesses disappear, it also has this effect on small and mid-sized manufacturers who say, you know, the way that I get my new products to the market is that I find a few local retailers who want to carry it, and maybe I grow business from there. But a lot of small and mid mid-sized manufacturers say, it's really hard to get noticed on Amazon. I, that's really not a viable way for me to grow my business. And so as the sort of ecology and diversity of the market goes away, they're really struggling as well. 
So we're losing businesses, which is an important source of job creation. Uh, it's a pathway to the middle class. But Amazon's also undermining our well-being through its impacts on working people. You know, about retail is this huge sector in the economy. It's about one out of every 10 workers is in retail. And as Amazon grows, it's displacing a lot of those jobs. And Amazon itself requires only about half as many workers to do distribute the same amount of goods. So you think about that, one out of 10 jobs in retail and a model that requires really only half of those people in the future. And as it moves into things like package delivery, you know, we can see UPS, the Postal Service, these are union jobs. These are sort of last surviving corners of the working middle class, and Amazon's replacing those with gig workers, uh, temporary employees. It's sort of labor model. You know, Amazon is very sort of futuristic in terms of its technology, but it's very 19th century when it comes to its labor model, um, and we're going to play that out. So there's a lot that's connected to inequality here. The last area that we explore in the report has to do with how Amazon affects the well-being of our communities and really how concentrated power is a threat to democracy, ultimately. You know, we tend to think that the political universe is like distinct from the economic universe, you know, so companies can get big in the economic universe, but that's different from our politics. But really, you know, concentrated power in the economic world almost inevitably turns into political power, right? You know, we know this, Amazon now spends more on lobbying than most big companies, including competitors like Walmart and Apple. One thing that it lobbied for recently that actually just passed this last week was a provision in the defense reauthorization bill that would, over time, transition federal government procurement of commercial products to an online e-commerce portal that, if you read the language, sounds a lot like Amazon. How many of you knew that that was happening? $53 billion in federal spending at play. Anyone in here know that that was happening? No, one person, yeah. Amazon knows. It's been lobbying on that for months, right? And there is a, you know, so who controls our government? Us or them? There is a local dimension to this too. You know, part of democracy, part of liberty is living in communities that have a degree of self-determination, you know, that we and our neighbors collectively have a measure of say over our lives, over our future. I don't mean to say that there's no room for big companies or national companies, but having something of an economy that is controlled locally is just so important. More and more, the economic decisions that affect our lives are being made in distant boardrooms. And as Am and, you know, in the case of Amazon, it's really severing the connection between place and commerce that's always existed throughout human history. You, know, you think about how important our local businesses are for how often we run into our neighbors, the anchor, the vital part of our downtowns. Um, they're also really important to the tax revenue base of a lot of our communities. A lot of commercial property tax revenue is a big chunk of local revenue. Um, what happens when we get rid of all of that, when we begin to sever that relationship between the geography of the places we live and, and the commercial heart that then underpins that? I don't think we've really, even as a society, begun to, to wrestle with that. And all of these connections that we started to draw in our research with Amazon and kind of these bigger picture issues that I'm talking about, when we went and looked at some of the latest economic research that's been published, we found that there are a lot of tie-ins to that, that places that have a larger share of local businesses have a bigger middle class, they have more social ties, they have more civic participation. There's a lot to be said, and they also have less income inequality. So all of these things are really tied up together, and I think we've been looking at so much of this kind of narrowly through the lens of consumers that we've sort of forgotten all the other ways in which the shape of our economy matters. So I want to wrap up this overview just sort of returning um, to the beginning of my uh, remarks and, uh, and sort of this idea of Amazon. You know, what we see of Amazon uh, floating above the surface is in fact connected to that sort of package on the doorstep, if you will, is in fact connected to something with a far you know, underlying uh, reach into all these different areas. We're going to talk more in the Q&A, I think, about how to respond to this as consumers, as communities, as elected officials. Um, but I want to offer a couple of initial points here as I close. One is that my argument is not an anti-technology argument. 
Digital innovation is a great thing. Being able to transact commerce through digital means, being able to add that on to the relationships we have with local businesses is welcome, it's inevitable. The question I think that we have to ask is how do we anchor those technological changes in a political economy that values place, that values relationships, that values equality, liberty, that values democracy? And the second point I want to make is that my argument is not that Amazon is an evil company and that that's the problem. We shouldn't expect companies to have our best interests in mind, at least not national companies. That's not their job, right? It doesn't really matter whether Amazon's intentions towards us are good or bad. The argument that, we've made, that we're making is that Amazon's dominance, the control that it has, is largely a product of public policy choices. Not just antitrust, but a lot of other ways in which over the years we have really favored and accelerated the growth of big business and you know, kind of undermined regional and local economies through very deliberate policy choices. So if we want to have a different kind of commerce, if we want to have a more competitive, uh, competitive uh, more equitable, uh, more uh, in keeping with democracy, then we really have to change these rules and that's really where we should look. So thank you. There we go. So um, while Stacy's getting her mic on, uh, two things are going to happen. Uh, Christina is going to be passing around. She's in the back. There is a, a, um, a clipboard that just has a place for your email. And Stacy promises this won't be spam mail, but she will mail to you resources. Uh, that um, she'll be either talking about or, may, or maybe not uh, that you might want to receive. So she will send one email out, um, maybe one more, but probably just one email. Just one email. Just if you want to links to some of this stuff and some of our work, this is a, I'll, I'll send one email and then that's, that's it. Great. And uh, we'll get to you in a minute. I'm just going to ask a few more questions just to go a little bit deeper um, about some things. And um, certainly, so... Olivia, I'm going to come to you first. And, you know, in, in September, Amazon uh, announced it would open its second headquarters, and famously, 200-some-odd uh, cities just, like, fell all over themselves to uh, send their proposals, uh, give them subsidies, uh, tax breaks. I, I think uh, you cited that New Jersey alone offered a package worth $7 million, billion, $7 billion? Seven billion dollars, um, and you uh, you also wrote an op-ed recently in which you argued that getting public subsidies is has been a part of Amazon's strategy for years. Can you speak to that a little bit more, and what's that all about, and and how they've been doing this for quite some time? I think that uh, that's a great place to start here because it uh, picks up with what Stacy was saying about how public policy is a big part of what has shaped uh, the conditions under which Amazon has gained as much dominance as it has. Um, and I, I think that there is this idea that Amazon has become as, as big as it has, as powerful as it has, um, kind of by outcompeting everyone else. Um, and I think that what we have found as we've looked closely at uh, the history of this company is that, in fact, from the very beginning, a key part of its strategy was uh, taking advantage of public handouts and benefits not available to its competitors, um, to smaller businesses, to different businesses. Um, and really, the, the first example, just the first one of those strategies, was how Amazon structured its growth around avoiding having to collect sales tax. Um, so Amazon's headquarters is located in Seattle. And Jeff Bezos, uh, the founder and CEO, has kind of famously said that he made that decision so that uh, he didn't have to collect sales tax in more populous California. Um, and now Amazon is uh, collecting sales tax on its direct sales. Uh, in all states that have sales tax. But 
As Stacy was saying, half of the sales on Amazon's platform are through its third-party marketplace, and Amazon doesn't collect sales tax on those sales. Uh, and that's still a huge amount of lost revenue for local and state governments. Um, just last week, we saw South Carolina uh, file a motion saying that uh, it was projecting a revenue hit of $500 million over five years um, from sales tax not being collected in Amazon's third party marketplace. And it was really explicit about what is at stake with that. It said, we are going to see businesses close uh, something, a, a quote very close to that uh, for collecting sales tax that this company doesn't have to. Um, and then just quickly, one other strategy that we've seen Amazon use is as it has built out its delivery and logistics network, um, warehouses, sortation centers around the country, it has really become a master at extracting public subsidies in the form of tax credits and incentives for those locations. Um, and our analysis uh, in partnership with another organization, Good Jobs First, shows that that is uh, a total of $1.1 billion in public handouts for those facilities. Um, and uh, so I, I think it, it together really illustrates the way that um, Amazon uh, is, is a key part of its strategy it is those policy moves. Um, and it's amazing that we've seen local and state governments uh, Go go along with that, as we did, they as you're saying again last week. They continue week. to do. They're fa falling all over themselves, r really. Um, right. Not not every every city and state, but many. Um, you know, given this and what you've um, said, uh, there is a growing concern among economists and many of us that corporate um, concentration may be going too far. Uh, some lawmakers are beginning to make the call for more rigorous antitrust policies, but Amazon is an interesting beast uh, around this. Can you talk about what's happening and how Amazon and the way they do business um, works um, in, in some new ideas about antitrust? Yeah, yeah. So as I mentioned, we, you know, back in the early 1980s, and, and this was really coming in the 70s through some changes in, in law and policy fields, a sort of new ideology that arose there and that was really embraced by Ronald Reagan, but also a lot of leading Democrats. There were these big changes in antitrust law. We didn't get rid of any of the laws. We still have very strong laws on the books, but we rewrote how the agencies interpret those laws. And what we said, you know, it used to be that antitrust was had this broad set of values, that it was about making sure that there were lots of opportunities for different competitors, you know, that we protected the freedom to go into the market and compete against other businesses um, on those terms. And we had this idea that, you know, antitrust should be not just about low prices for consumers, but also about making sure that working people had competition for their labor, so that, you know, that would keep wages where they should be and so on. It was just a much more expansive and, and, and sort of comprehensive sense of, about economic concentration. We threw that all out in the 80s, and we said, the only thing that matters is low prices in the short term. Anything else, you can be anti-competitive, you can knock competitors out of the market in aggressive and predatory ways. As long as we're getting low prices in the short term, we're okay. Now fast forward, and the consequences of those changes have really come to bear, and there's this fascinating growing body of research by really top economists who are finding that concentration, and you know, we've seen this in retail, banking, agribusiness, media, all these sectors of our economy, that as fewer and fewer companies dominate, and there are fewer small businesses and medium-sized businesses, that it, that's actually connected to rising in income inequality, that there's a smaller middle class and growing income inequality. And that it's also connected to why we're not seeing um, the kind of investment and increases in productivity that that's also tied to this concentration because there's not enough competition. So, you know, normally the way innovation and productivity gains come along is that companies are trying to, you know, race for to be the winner. We don't have that anymore. The big companies are just kind of sitting on their market and keeping other little companies at bay. 
So there's all this fascinating economics research, and it's starting to filter into the public conversation. And we've now got elected officials, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Al Franken. We've also got folks on the Republican side, Chuck Grassley to a degree, have started to really speak out and say, we made a mistake back in the 80s when we made these changes. And there's now this growing movement that's gathering steam and is really looking at bringing some of those broader values back into antitrust enforcement. And so, you know, I think with Amazon, there's a lot of talk um, on the Hill and elsewhere about platform power. And people are drawing this connection back to the railroads. Because, you know, when the railroads first got started, they were owned by a few industrialists. Um, and those uh, industrialists, they controlled the rails and they used that control to extort money from farmers and small business people that needed to get to market. And then also in the industries where they owned, you know, had significant shares in the industries, they would, their industrial competitors, they'd say, sorry, you can't ride our rail lines. We own this and we're gonna compete with you in coal or steel or whatever it is by just blocking you from the market. That's kind of the sort of power that Amazon has developed by owning these pipelines. And so there are growing numbers of people on the Hill who are saying, maybe we should think about what we did with the rails, which was we made them common carriers. We subjected them to regulation and said, you have to create a level playing field. I love the way you use riding the rails quite often in your speaking about uh, Amazon. Um, Olivia, this is um, an another piece is about the labor market and the labor model. Um, that Stacy spoke to a little bit, and we're looking at these cities that are looking for jobs. That's, that's one of the reasons they want headquarters there. Mm -hmm. um, but the model is quite different, and a lot of people are very concerned about uh, the labor model that it seems that Amazon has. Can you speak to that just in a little bit more depth? Right, yes. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think as uh, Stacy was describing, a lot of people look at this company and say, Amazon is, is a tech company, it's innovative. Um, and actually what we see with its labor model is this kind of low road approach that is really quite retrograde um, and really about uh, lessening stability for the people on one side of that labor model and increasing wealth for the people at the top of that model. Um, and I, I think it's, uh, there are a few kind of different buckets of types of work at Amazon. One of those buckets is uh, the jobs in its warehouses. Um, and one of the things we know about those is that, you know, just for starters, they are really grueling. Um, we know that Amazon sets uh, productivity targets that are intentionally too high to create a kind of frantic pace in the warehouses. Um, we know that there is a lot of repetitive and strenuous bending and kneeling uh, running across these vast facilities. Um, we also know that uh, the wages aren't good. Uh, we looked at 11 metro areas where Amazon has a large presence, and we found that uh, its average wages are 15% lower than uh, the average wage for comparable work in the same region. Um, or even for people in, in retail stores, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, and then uh, a, a third thing is, uh, as Stacy was saying, while this company is often hailed as a job creator, just because you know it's a big company, and so when it's hiring, I think its scale can be kind of a distraction from uh, some of the, or, or a uh, red herring from some of the deeper changes that it is uh, kind of fueling. Um, but that we know that as, as it grows, it displaces sales at other businesses and that smaller retail companies employ uh, about twice as many people for the same amount in revenue. So we're talking about a, a net loss in jobs overall. Um, but then just to briefly mention a kind of second category of jobs, which are um, one example of how Amazon is getting into another area is that package delivery uh, example. And there we see Amazon um, acquiring thousands of trailers, uh, leasing a fleet of cargo planes. Um, and another thing that they're doing is increasingly taking package delivery to uh, people's doors in-house. Um, and doing that by contracting with kind of low-cost regional couriers. And 
Uh, one way that these couriers keep costs down is that the uh, drivers who are delivering packages aren't employees, they're independent contractors, which means that they are on the hook for a lot of uh, expenses, like uh, insurance, fuel, kind of other things that come up day to day. And there's been a series of lawsuits around the country from these drivers saying, you know, actually what this means is that often we are not making minimum wage. Um, and so I, I, I think, uh, and then contrast that with um, what have historically been good, stable, unionized, family-supporting positions. Uh, UPS and USPS together employ a million people in the US. Um, and you know the model that we're seeing Amazon adopting is, is not that model. Thank you, Olivia. So how should we respond? to Amazon, you know, should, should people stop shopping? Should we, um, you know, what, what can local communities do? Want to, Stacey, you want to start that? What can we do? Sure, yeah, I mean, I feel like there's almost maybe three different ways we could think about this. One is sort of us as consumers. Um, and I guess I would say there, you know, um, it, it, well, I think it's really important to begin to sort of have more of a conversation. As I said, I think a lot of these connections people haven't really made, you know, Amazon is sort of, quietly crept into our lives without us fully reckoning with what it is. You know, one of the things that I've noticed, you know, Amazon doesn't have any facilities in Maine. I don't think they do here either. And one of the consequences of that is I don't know how many stories my local newspapers run about Amazon, probably virtually none. Um, you know, certainly not about Amazon's effect on the Maine economy. Um, so there's just not been a public discussion in the way there was when Walmart was expanding, for example. So I think engaging your neighbors and friends and family and so on uh, in learning more about this company and just talking about it is a really good idea. And I would say as consumers, you know, um, there are lots of independent businesses that offer, have robust e-commerce sites. And so it, it takes a little bit to go looking and to ask the retailers that you go to what they offer on that front. Um, my local bookstore is happy to get an email from me that has the title of the book in the subject line, and I just know it'll be there uh, the next day, and I don't have to do anything further. So it's very convenient. Um, so I would say look at those other options. Um, you know, that there's a lot to be said, too, for face-to-face -face interaction and what local businesses, you know, what it means to shop locally and run into your neighbors. And I think brick and mortar, as Michael said at the beginning, is so important. But when you need the convenience or the alternative of shopping online, thinking about how you can support those same businesses that you love being in your community um, by choosing their website or, or their email. Um, and I don't know if you want to talk a little bit maybe about some of the ways that communities can think about small business since you've done so much research in that area. And then I also have some policymaker ideas. So. Okay, great. And then we'll get to you. So if you have questions, uh, just coming to that. Go ahead, Olivia. Great. Yeah. Um, they're, they're definitely at the, particularly the local government level, there's a lot of the um, kind of support for locally owned businesses that can really help as uh, local businesses are encountering kind of this rising challenge and, and, and a, a menu of others too. Um, so one of the things that uh, we've seen cities and, and towns use to really um, positive effect is uh, just making sure that the built environment isn't changing in a way that is uh, inhospitable to locally owned businesses. Um, so a lot of new developments uh, are built with big retail spaces, um, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 foot retail spaces. Um, and those are the kind of spaces that are really well suited to national chains um, or you know, maybe like a Whole Foods, which is now owned by Amazon. Um, mm -hmm. And locally owned independent businesses tend to do really well in smaller formats, um, 1,000 square feet, 2,000 square feet. And this is a place where cities have a lot of authority. Um, they can you know, encourage or, or implement zoning that says uh, in new developments, uh, spaces should be sized in a certain way, um, should have uh, these, these types of formats. Um, so I think there's, there are a lot of places uh, for cities to use kind of existing economic development and planning tools um, that support locally owned businesses and, and that that can go a long way. Okay, and 
Stacy, you wanted to talk about policy. Yeah, I mean, I think in addition to sort of local communities, and we have a lot of examples on our website of things that local places can do to really boost and support and make sure that there are the kinds of places where local businesses can really thrive. Um, so that's part of it at the local level. And then at the state and federal level, you know, I do think that getting engaged in this antitrust conversation is really critical. And you know, your members of Congress should hear from you about that issue. Um, it's also something you might raise with your state attorney general because that's, you know, states also have their own antitrust laws and they've kind of gone the way of the federal laws, but there are more AGs now that are going, hey, maybe there's something going on with this. Um, we also need to really get uh, a handle on the economic development subsidies. I mean, this bidding war that Amazon has set off with HQ2 is just astonishing because in addition to the fact that the biggest bid on the table, as you mentioned, is $7 billion. That's $2 billion more than Amazon says its headquarters is gonna cost it to develop over 10 years. So we're gonna pay for your headquarters and give you $2 billion. And this is what New Jersey and the city of Newark are offering. It's also $2 billion more than Amazon's entire profit over its 20-year 20, 20 history. So just to give you some context, I did a little bit of like math, you know, just kind of back of the napkin math. With $7 billion, you could pay the rent of every small business in the county that encompasses Newark for the next 10 years. That's how much money that is, you know. So you just, it's just insane. But the money is funny, funny enough, is not even the biggest, I think, value that Amazon has gotten out of this. What they've gotten out of this is that elected officials across the country, Democrats, Republicans, everybody, progressives, have, have been out there basically telegraphing to their constituents that Amazon's further growth is something we should all fervently wish for. You know, I mean, that has been the secret PR move of this whole thing. Local governments give away about $70 billion a year in economic development subsidies. And research has shown that between 70 and 90% of those dollars go to the absolute biggest companies. Hmm. So you begin to think about, what if we didn't spend that much money? What if we just got rid of those deals and we took a little bit of that money and we put it into programs to help new entrepreneurs get started? How might we use this to close the racial wealth gap? You know, how might we help young entrepreneurs of color get started? How might we close the small business lending gap? You, know, you start to go down that road and you can begin to envision a public policy that really supports a much more competitive and robust kind of economy that creates more opportunity for people. So I think those are the two of the really big things, antitrust and subsidies that are on my list. Awesome, thank you. And the other thing about labor is they're working on robots and automation, so many of those jobs might disappear soon. So Teresa has a microphone, or do you have a, a question right here, right in the front? Or go ahead, maybe, maybe this mic will pick you up. <laughs> <laughs> what about creating our own site and having local businesses put their, um, their product on it to, and then Maybe we can have a, a place that'll deliver it for them. So a city to have their own site for local businesses? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty cool idea. I like it. You know, maybe it's Burlington wide and you get a bike, bike courier delivery service to do the deliveries. I think that could be really nice. Uh, yes, Teresa's coming with a microphone to uh, this gentleman. Not allowed the... to hand it out. I'm allowed to put it. So um, the European Union sometimes has a different attitude towards American predatory monopolists. Uh, some of the tech firms have run into it. I'm just wondering how they approach Amazon, what its conduct is like in the European Union, and whether it holds any lessons for the United States. Thank you. Mm, that's a great question. Yeah, the EU has been ahead of us lately um, in terms of antitrust concerns, particularly with regard to tech companies and the power that they have. Um, it's gonna be really interesting to watch because they're becoming more aggressive and looking a lot more closely at these issues um, further ahead of us. One of the rulings that they've had recently has been around Amazon's tax um, evasion, I guess you could say. They have a, a headquarters in Luxembourg, which is a really tiny place, but is also a tax haven. Um, so instead of being in England, where they have a lot of sales, or Germany, where they have a lot of warehouses, they put their European headquarters in Luxembourg. 
And what that's done is they do a lot of what's called transfer pricing. So the Luxembourg headquarters own certain trade and um, you know, uh, uh, intellectual property of Amazon's and then Amazon US and Amazon and other European countries pay to use those properties. They pay outsized prices and the effect of that is that income that should be taxed here or taxed elsewhere in Europe um, gets written off as a business cost. So here, you know, the effective federal tax rate that Amazon pays is about a third of what a typical independent retailer pays. Um, so one of the things the European Union has done recently is kind of really looked closely at that Luxembourg thing because there are a lot of ways in which they really believe that tax loopholes tilt the playing field. So they look at that as a competition issue. They say it's not a fair playing field if one company is able to pay so little in taxes. So I would love to see that kind of thinking adopted here. And it would certainly change, I think, the conversation about, about taxes. And it's going to be really interesting to see what they do on antitrust, too. Other questions? Uh, why don't we go right to the back there, and then we'll come forward to this gentleman in red. So I think that's Kathy back there. Thank you. Um, two things. First, I wanted to say that this morning I heard on NPR that Amazon, the new Amazon Key program, have you heard about this? Amazon's going to be delivering things to your house and going into it. <laughs> You're going to give them a key to actually go in your house. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, but my, I have a question. My question is, um, you said that Amazon is a defense contractor. I, that is news to me. What, what, is the, what is the Defense Department buying from Amazon? Go ahead. Um, uh, cloud computing capacity. Uh, as Stacy was mentioning, um, uh, Amazon controls 44% of uh, that capacity worldwide, and the CIA uh, and other US intelligence agencies um, are a major client. Uh, it is a $150 million contract, I think, uh, for that cloud computing capacity. Um, and it was Amazon and IBM bidding for it, and uh, Amazon, Amazon got the contract. Sort of, uh, there, was, there was some controversy in how that played out, too. Um, mm -hmm. And now there, there is this uh, additional amendment in the defense reauthorization bill uh, that would uh, make Amazon a leading contender, if not the only contender, to get the bid for uh, kind of regular purchasing of goods uh, for the Defense Department, too. One of the things Amazon has done is they've really focused on government uh, recently. Um, you know, they, they've had this uh, contract to do the cloud computing services for the intelligence agencies for several years now. I forget when they got that. Um, but they're a major defense contractor as a result because it's a big contract. Um, but they've also been building out, they have a, there's a sort of public uh, sector, uh, they call it, part of Amazon business. So there's an entity called Amazon Business. And for businesses that buy stuff online, office supplies, other things that you need to run a business, there's a special Amazon, part of Amazon, just for that. And they're really go, going after a lot of businesses to buy their supplies there. They also, as part of that, have a government outreach. So they want to transition a lot of government procurement to Amazon. So the federal piece I mentioned that went through in this bill um, will start to begin to create an online portal of which we think Amazon will be the major beneficiary of. Walmart may get some of that business too at the federal level. It's about a $53 billion that the federal government spends on just sort of commercial goods, things that you, know, you could buy at a, you know, that we can all buy. But then they're also looking uh, and really focusing on state and local. And so there are a growing number of school districts, counties, and cities that are actually buying more and more of their purchases from Amazon. And we're working on a research project right now to look more closely uh, at how extensive that is and uh, where it goes. We know that some places have local purchasing policies where they really um, have a, a, a model internally to choose local businesses if it's feasible and affordable. Um, to keep the public dollars going to support local businesses and local jobs. Um, so we know that that's true, but we also know a lot of other cities don't have those policies and they are shifting more and more of our tax dollars to, to Amazon. And it's tempting because it's so easy. Was there someone over here, Teresa? Oh, here you go. 
Thank you, and then we'll, we'll come forward to this. Thanks. Um, I don't know how the thought is. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so um, I, really, I really like the discussion about um, like, like local policy um, kind of really giving Amazon like, the boosters to get to this like, giant monster that they are now. Um, one thing that um, I think kind of, I see kind of getting left out a lot out of a lot of these uh, conversations, um, like out of so, like to kind of generate solutions to these things, is uh, I always see like a lack of um, touch on like investment in like future generations, like because our education system is like really bad, and uh, without like educated people, like we're never going to be able to generate the people that have the like the intelligence, the resources to be able to come up with like solutions to Amazon, like the better shipping way or whatever that starts in Burlington, Vermont, where you're never gonna get like, like the next Google to show up because you have less and less people that have like these resources, the, the, this education to get there. I don't know um, what my question was, sorry. But um, yeah. I was wondering, oh, like, so it, since you did, you did touch on like public policy, you touched on um, how it's more of like a giant system thing. Like, have you looked into anything that has to do with um, like, like younger people kind of feeding into politics, younger people influencing politics that like to prevent this kind of thing from happening? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Where do young people fit in? Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I really appreciate that question. Um, we don't do a lot with, with young people getting into politics per se, but I, I will offer this one sort of, I think, related observation to, to your comment, um, which is that when we think about, um, well, here's a statistic. Um, We've seen this real start, sharp drop off in new business formation. Um, so we're now creating new businesses at, at one third the rate that we were creating new businesses back in like 20 years ago. You know, we think we're this nation of startups, but in reality, we're not such a nation of startups anymore. Um, and there are lots of factors that feed into that. And we've talked about some of them tonight. But I think, you know, and we also know that millennials are starting businesses at a much lower rate than previous generations did in the, at, when they were that same age. So there's something going on out there. When I think about what is it that, we, that a, someone needs as, a, as an entrepreneur to actually be successful in starting a business, you need someone who has know-how. And so that really speaks to your point about education and training and opportunities and mentorship, which we don't invest in enough. You need um, capital. And a big challenge there is that we're losing the community banks that do a lot of that lending. And we really need to, as, a, as states and at the federal level, make sure we have strong, small, local banks, because that's where a lot of small business capital comes from. And then finally, we need the right kinds of environments, you know, the right sort of place in, in which a business can thrive. And that really goes to some of what Olivia was talking about in terms of keeping our downtowns and our town centers healthy, because that kind of varied environment of mix of different uh, buildings of different ages and small and large spaces and places where people interact and ideas bump up against one another to sort of paraphrase Jane Jacobs, those are the environments that are so, uh, they're like good habitat for local businesses. So I think those are the three kinds of policy things that I would think about is like capital, environment, and then how do we help train new people and particularly younger millennial folks into starting businesses. Yeah, we'll take just a few more questions. Teresa, there, there are two down here. There's this gentleman in red and, and Mr. Morrow. Do you still have a question, sir? Right, right here in red. He's, he's been very patient. I don't, I don't think I need that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a lot of it has to do with um, one of the things that's, that economists are seeing that's holding down wages is there's actually not enough competition for labor. And part of it is because we're not creating new jobs the way that we used to. You know, most new job growth comes from very young businesses. So when businesses start that first five years, if they grow, um, well, many don't. But the ones that grow, that's where a lot of new job creation comes. And so we're not getting new jobs created that way. And so the existing employers have a lot of power. And Amazon, it's something called monopsony power. I can't say that this is for sure the reason, but it does seem that in the 11 metros we looked at, and the, the difference ranged from 6% less than the going rate for similar kinds of warehouse work to I think it was up to 22% less than the going rate for Amazon warehouse work. 
So there's a pool of, un, uh, of people who have not been able to find work, and it's easy to bid down that, that labor that way. But that doesn't make sense. Either there are comparable jobs that pay more, at which point I would take them, or there are not. They're not job openings. They're jobs that are actually held by other people. So it's existing employees at other warehouses that are doing comparable work, what they make, versus so what Amazon is paying. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, that was confusing. Good distinction. Um, Mr. Mora, right, right here, Teresa. Ed. Oh, sorry, and then Michael. Thank you. With your uh, experience um, in talking in different communities, getting feedback, your research, but also your sense of what's happening out there in the, the public thinking, um, could you talk a little bit about the possibility of um, adopting either nationally, at a state level, local levels, laws and regulation that are, that are centered around quality of life? Mm -hmm. Most of our laws and regulations deal with specific things that are not as vague as quality of life. Many regulations and laws in France, for instance, really describe a quality of life that they want in a neighborhood, in a community. In Paris, every neighborhood should be entitled to have a bookstore. This is in regulation. Mm -hmm. So every neighborhood in Paris does have a bookstore. They're protected um, because that's good for the community. So th this, this is a whole idea that I think is, that my sense is very foreign to our present political ethic and thinking. Uh, but have you run into anything that would give me hope? <laughs> That's a really interesting question, and I think a really interesting point. I mean, I think you see it some when you look at some local comprehensive plans and zoning ordinances, and I mean, to some degree you have it here in the form of Act 250 in the sense that there is this statewide planning law that says, you know, town centers matter, but downtowns matter. Um, you know, and there's no other state that really has something statewide that's like that. Um, and you know, it's, it, there are economic elements, obviously, to the law and environmental elements to the law, but there's also something there about this notion that community and place and cohesiveness matters. And I think that, to some degree, gets at the, uh, the point that you're making. You know, I've, re I've read a number of comprehensive plans for communities that talk about quality of life. Like if you just go pull the comprehensive plan for Portland, Maine, or any number of cities, and go read through it, you'll see all kinds of stuff in there that refers to what you're talking about. Like the idea of healthy neighborhoods that have mixes of businesses, where you run into people on the street, where people feel a sense of connection to one another. Um, you know, all those values are expressed there, and I think, what, has, what happens is that somehow that set of intentions doesn't get translated to zoning policy or to kind of hard rules. And that, I think you're right, there is this way in which we then go over into this other brain and say, oh, well, this can only be about economics or number of parking spaces or you know, whatever it may be. And we don't really remember that we had this set of values. And, you know, a lot of the kind of democracy elements of this that I talked about are also, I think, in that. You know, we're like afraid to touch the economy with these other things. And yet, if you look at the research, we know that all these things matter to economies. The democratic places, the healthy downtowns, that places preserve quality of life, they have better out economic outcomes. You can measure it. I mean, it's just true. But we're hesitant. You know, we feel, you know, we sort of embrace this ideology of the free market despite how many subsidies we give away to Amazon or, or anyone else, but it holds us back from, from expressing those in policy. And part of what we're trying to do at, at ILSR is to change that, you know, not only in the work that we do around independent business, but the work we do across a number of different sectors of the economy. And there's right right over here. It seems also just a, a quick rural places are not really the best places for efficiency and these other things that antitrust rules are understanding it or, or being cheaper i mean it's it's the rural places that seem to have really been left out in this it's picture it's totally true and and you know when you look at at new job formation it's happening only in a handful of big metro areas you know so many regions of the country rural areas you know uh 
this is the cities in the Midwest are just being left behind, small towns. You know, and this has political ramifications, you know? I mean, there are ways in which we pay a price for not having opportunity distributed widely. Michael. Thank you. Um, Stacy and Olivia, big fan. Thank you for bringing this hard message uh, to us. It's hard to hear, uh, but important to hear. Um, and uh, Front Porch Forum uh, that I'm aligned with is glad to be a co-sponsor tonight. And I wanted to ask a question. Um, I've been a big fan of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance for, for a long time as well. And in my travels, I think people in Vermont can grasp the concept of local when you're talking about food. Everybody gets that, you know, eat local. Uh, I think they get it, uh, you know, in my conversations about local decision making at a government level, local government versus state government versus federal. It starts to get harder to, to get the message across, though. Uh, and I, well, I think they get it with bricks and mortar versus Walmart. And that's that's an, an, an argument that we've been having, and as you pointed out, very public uh, discussion for years. But I, I think a lot of us have trouble understanding that Amazon versus an online retailer, like that doesn't seem like a, a buy local, eat local kind of thing. And even the next step um, with news and, and social networking, a lot of uh, people with a, a strong local ethic here will you know, do everything through Facebook. Everything goes towards Twitter. It, it's like there's, um, and, and representing Front Porch Forum, I have a, a vested interest here, but we've got uh, VPR, we've, um, Seven Days is in, you know, in the room, um, VT Digger, of course, uh, Mealtrain.com, another kind of social networking outfit here. Uh, all these great local online sources. Um, and there's the same kind of struggle that plays out um, with, with the Facebooks of the world. And you could make, and I'm sure people are, write a very similar story about how Facebook operates. It's starting to come out with, with all sorts of stories in, in mainstream media these days. But just wondering what your thoughts are about translating local from bricks and mortar to online and then to, you know, onto other spheres. Thank you, Thanks. Michael. That's a great comment. I, you know, I think, um, I don't know what you had to add to this, but I, you know, I think, um, you know, those examples you gave of food and brick and mortar versus big box, um, that didn't happen, that wasn't always the case. It took a concerted movement to make that happen, local food movement and then sort of the buy local movement in the context of independent businesses. And so we're kind of dealing with a new thing here and we need to, that's why I, I, you know, I think just the conversation is so important in getting more coverage and more conversation going about what some of these implications are. You know, I'm hoping that we've had, um, you know, that the, the sort of tech, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and so on, that we're, we've kind of, you know, we, we jumped in, you know, fully, you know, as, as people. And now that we've kind of immersed ourselves in it, maybe are also realizing that there's something that we might have left behind, that it isn't everything that we thought, you know, and so on. So I do think there is more conversation starting to happen around this, and that when we look at, we can learn something from those other movements. So one of the things we, we did learn, and, and having done this a, a lot of work over the years with independent business alliances and local first initiatives and so on around the country, is that what matters is when it's neighbor to neighbor. It's when there's a community organization locally that's talking about this and encouraging people to take some kind of action that a national group or a national message or a Facebook group or whatever doesn't have the same impact. And so, you know, I don't know what the, you know, I, I don't spend as much time thinking about social media as I do, um, you know, some of the retail sector stuff that we do work on. But I, I sort of wonder if there's like a, you know, a kind of turn your social media off for, you know, one Sunday a month or, you know, I don't know what the thing is, but something you can kind of generate locally that is a way of, of getting people to step back a little bit and look at, some of these um, consequences of, of losing face-to-face -face relationships and what you might think about replacing it with. Like what is, you know, if buy local is the alternative to Walmart, you know, how do we talk about or think about community initiatives that give us that thing that we're really missing, you know? And in a lot of people, the, the, the levels in terms of loneliness out there and, you know, apparently being lonely is worse for you than smoking cigarettes in terms of your health, you know? I mean, there's a lot that people, you know, in their lives feel is missing. I um, 
I said we'd close around 7.15. We're already going a little long. I think um, Stacy um, and, and Olivia will stay here for a little bit longer uh, for those of you that still have questions. Can we, uh, can we just do one more, Fran? Yeah, and there will also, um, there, is, uh, there are refreshments in the back room, so please come back. And uh, one, what, one more, just she oh, was, Teresa, she's just for so you. Patient. A a absolutely. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I missed you. One last question. Thanks, everybody. Sorry. Well, thank you for the opportunity, and this was very informative. So I appreciate that. I actually originally asked my question on Facebook Live, so this is interesting follow up. So <laughs> I will um, read it now. But as a, I'm a Vermonter, born and raised, and I'm a strong supporter of local um, because I really do believe in the community aspect. That's why I am here tonight. But I also do shop on Amazon for bulk items, and I feel as though for Vermont that it's really important to kind of step up your game to be like a very premium retailer, and whether that's customer service or, you know, the look and feel of where you're shopping. Um, what's the best way for these businesses to kind of step up their game if they're struggling financially? You should talk about our survey. Yeah. That you've been putting out. <laughs> uh, we have uh, just spent a few weeks. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the changing retail landscape. You know, we're seeing uh, national chain stores declaring bankruptcy, malls going vacant, um, and we decided to look at how independent retailers are uh, kind of being impacted with and, and dealing with this changing retail landscape. Um, and we surveyed 850 uh, independent retailers uh, in 49 states across the country. Um, and uh, a, a two thirds of them uh, said that they're uh, weathering the storm okay, as well or better than chain stores. Um, and a majority of them said that they see opportunity in chain store closures for independents. Um, and you know, it kind of spoke to this picture of some of these things are playing out differently for independents than they are for national chains. Um, and I think you know how that gets at your question is because they also were saying this is because of our distinct strengths. Um, this is because uh, it can actually be kind of inconvenient to read a bunch of online reviews for something and have to sift through things. And there's, a, there's convenience and, and enjoyment um, and value in kind of uh, relying on the expertise of a local retailer, um, getting that good customer service, um, having the curated selection. You don't have to do as much research. Um, and I think that. Uh, independent retailers do really have these, these strengths that people continue to value and that are distinct from uh, other, other dominant companies. Um, and so continuing to tell those stories about uh, the value that they provide there. Um, I think your, your point about how to, how to do that with fewer resources um, is a, is a good one too. Um, I think one of the things that we have seen be really effective in cities across the country is those businesses coming together um, in independent business alliances, shop local campaigns, um, forums like this one tonight, uh, to be able to tell that story collectively and, and make the case for uh, what they bring to communities as employers, as neighbors, as kind of the, the sum of all of their parts. What I loved about the survey responses, and we're going to be publishing this on Wednesday, right? Um, what I loved about these survey responses is that, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag. I mean, 90% of the retailers in the survey said that Amazon is having a negative impact on their business, and 28% said a significant negative impact on their business. So shouldn't gloss over that. But what they also said is when it comes to out surviving my national chain competitors, I am ready to fight and I have these things going for me. I can give the best service around. I have these deep connections to my community and that really matters that the ways in which I know this community and I'm integrated as a business in this community really matters. 
and also like the experience that I can provide in my store, like what it means to be out and be, you know, to be able to play with the new toys at the toy store or to go into the bookstore. You know, if you go into a bookstore, you're three times more likely to discover a book that you want to read that you didn't know about than if you're on Amazon. And the expertise that Olivia mentioned, you know, in terms of like the convenience of being able to say, I have a four-year-old niece, I have no idea what she wants this holiday season, but the toy store owner does because they know toys inside and out in a way that Target doesn't. You know, you're not going to get that in most places. So it was really encouraging to see, as I said, a mixed bag, a challenging landscape, but independents have these things that they know the chains can't beat them on. And I think that's the kind of stuff that we have to, you know, emphasize and go back to. Right, and, and in, in closing, you know, the, this, this story about Amazon really seems to have engaged the media in a way that maybe, you know, hasn't, you haven't gotten as much traction, and I think it's fantastic. Um, so I'm wondering, just in, just in closing, either, you know, something that really gives you hope now and or a quick tip for what we can do next week to um, start moving things in another direction. So, mm. so take either one of those uh, to, to take us out and back into um, uh, visiting in the back. You want to start, Olivia? Yeah. Um, I, th I think something that gives me hope is that I think a lot of the things that we are talking about here tonight make a kind of intuitive sense to people. Um, there are things that we can see happening in our communities. There are, there are things that we, uh, we know the experience of going into a store and, and having this um, exchange that is also social and connecting and uh, more than kind of the exchange of, of money for goods. Um, and I, I think that there are ways that we are kind of catching up to uh, some of the changes that we've seen in our economy, um, but that there, there is uh, energy and 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 uh, kind of growing awareness there to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and Stacy. Well, I guess you you gave hope, so I'll take the what should you what might you do. I guess the two things that come to mind is you know I, I would love it if you shared some of what we talked about tonight or any thoughts that you you know that came to you in the course of this conversation with someone else maybe someone in your family or friend or an acquaintance um, I think that would be great and then the other thing I would love is if you um, you know talk to your elected officials and members of Congress and so on uh, about things like antitrust and how important it is. Because I think that, you know, as we're seeing all this economic research and stuff is sort of happening at this level, it's going to be from the grassroots, right, that is ultimately going to change things. And so that kind of engagement, I think, is really important. Okay. Stacy Mitchell and Olivia Lavecchia, thank you so much for the incredible work that you do. Okay. And thank you all for coming tonight for your questions. Michael has the last word. I was going to ask about Amazon Smile, but we'll let that one go. Uh, I want to thank, oh gosh, where's my list? Well, I want to thank Front Porch Forum, Ed Morrow and the Northshire Bookstore, Teresa Murray and Vermont Digger, F Cabot Cheese, Vermont Coffee, and Red Hen Bakery, and particularly for me, the Main Street Alliance, which has been teaching me more about how to do some of this organizing and grassroots work. But I also want to thank all of you for giving up your time tonight and coming here, sharing some great questions and sharing some valuable time with these wonderful people from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, Stacy and Olivia. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.